All right, everybody, welcome back to the Break Hard Podcast. My name is Matt. Once again, you have just me. I will be doing a few test shows later in the week that probably won't ever see the light of day, but they will at least allow me to figure out how a co-host situation will work here. Life is just a little bit busy. But this weekend, we had absolutely phenomenal racing top to bottom. You have the Truck Series race on Saturday night, at Kansas. You have the Cup Series race on Sunday night at Kansas, even though it wasn't meant to be at night. And you have the Formula One Miami Grand Prix on Sunday. And it was great. The Sunday races were swept by McLaren drivers. And some of you are wondering, well, Kyle Larson races for Hendrick Motorsports. He does, but he will also be making his Indy 500 start with McLaren, which is really great for him and the team. And McLaren's now won in all four series so far that they compete in this year. They have an IndyCar win, Formula E, Extreme E, and now a Formula One win, which is phenomenal, right? And it's only May. They got all four of them checked off pretty early on in the season in the grand scheme of things. But we have to start, of course, with the Cup Series race on Sunday, Sunday night at Kansas Speedway. After we sat around for three, three and a half hours, we were treated to the closest finish in NASCAR Cup Series history. Kyle Larson edges out Chris Buescher at the line and beats him by one one thousandth of a second. Just an absolutely insane finish, which was set up by Kyle Busch spinning out with five laps to go in the race, setting up a green-white checker finish, and that resulted in an interesting pit strategy, which we'll get to in just a second, because it was... Not exactly straightforward. It was straightforward, but it wasn't. So when Kyle Busch spins out, Martin Truex Jr. is hunting down the 11 car of Denny Hamlin. Hamlin has to save fuel, and Truex is going full bore. And it would have been really interesting to see how that played out at the end, because I think Truex would have gotten to him. Chris Gabehart and Hamlin's crew chief said after, after the race. race, they were assuming that Denny was likely going to run out, you know, in turn four, coming to the finish line somewhere in that area. Obviously, we'll never know. Caution comes out. Everybody pits. Truex's team takes four tires. So the first team that takes four tires, everyone else takes two tires. Just right sides, of course. The left sides weren't wearing at all, where the right sides, some drivers like Kyle Larson were courting them. Larson, on that final run, definitely probably had the fastest car, and everybody thought that he should have been in that position that Truex was in. But he came over the radio uh, right you know, towards the end of that run and said, I've absolutely courted the right front. It has to be courted. And he picked up a really big push, and ultimately was not going to win. Like, like caution comes out, everybody takes two tires. That brings them in. And uh, Denny Hamlin took two as well. Truex then restarts 11th. And on that restart, he manages to go from 11th to a fourth-place finish, which is pretty stellar for him. Not as great as Kyle Busch, who went from, I believe, 20th to 8th out over those final two laps. He was absolutely hauling there at the end. But, but it set, set up this all-time finish. finish. So going into turn three on the last lap, lap Kyle, Kyle Larson gets a run on Chris Busher. Busher gives him the high line. line. And honestly, I don't think Busher thought that Larson was going to go all the way up there. there. I think Busher was like, oh, there's, there's not a lane, lane there. there. Kyle's not going to fit there. there. Except, Except Kyle Larson loves to run the wall. And if you're going to give him a little bit of space, he's going to take all of it up there. And he did just that. And for, and for once, once, Kyle Larson, Larson didn't put it in the wall and do what he typically does by throwing, throwing away race wins. wins. Instead, he drag, drag races the 17 off the corner, bangs, bangs the door not, not once but twice coming to the line, and then, and then beats, beats him to the finish line. And that's where there's a little bit of controversy. Not about the beating and banging. Rubbin's just racing, right? No. Well, the controversy surrounds some of the fans in NASCAR not understanding what the finish line is. So when you look at the finish line at Kansas Speedway, it is not... <laughs> 100% straight. The portion of the white finish line on the racetrack is thicker than the portion of the finish line that is on the apron. Chris Buescher was on the apron, so it makes it appear that he, you know, in theory, potentially reached the finish line first, but because that line on the apron is not as thick as the one on top, then he had to travel an extra, you know, inch or two to get that. Except that's not how NASCAR scores these finishes. So when the race finished, NASCAR timing and scoring, it triggered and it popped up that Chris Buescher was the winner. And when you looked at it, it said Buescher was the winner. And it had it listed as Martin Victory won 1,000 of a second. And then about 45 to 60 seconds later, time and scoring flipped and said Kyle Larson was the winner by one 1,000th of a second. Cliff Daniels came over the radio to Kyle Larson. I was listening to their scanner at the end of the race. And he comes over the radio and says, oh, we didn't get it. 
they went to the 17, and Larson was like, oh, man, like, he was bummed, but he wasn't, like, upset about it. And then Tyler Munn, his crew chief, goes crazy, or spotter, sorry, not crew chief, spotter, goes absolutely wild, saying that we won, we won, we won. And Cliff Daniels had mentioned before, you know, it was ruled that Larson won, that his timing scoring on the box showed it at 0.000, so a virtual tie. What happens in these situations, situations is NASCAR, NASCAR goes back and looks at their high-speed camera review. They'll do a review of the finish. They're not looking at the finish line that is painted on the racetrack. That's an arbitrary line. It's there essentially just for show. It's there to just show fans where the start-finish line is at. Ultimately, that is not the finish line that NASCAR uses to determine these finishes. Instead, NASCAR has a high-speed camera, and part of that high-speed camera is a built-in line that is perfectly straight for the desired location of the finish line for them. They went ahead and shared the photo of it. They got out from the conspiracy theorists real quick on Sunday night. They shared the photo of it. They shared where the overlay is of what they refer to as the finish line. And, you know, the photo of the finish. And that would be Larson edging out. Chris, Chris Buescher Buescher by literally an inch. inch. It, is it is what it is. is. NASCAR, NASCAR is actually really good, good when it comes to these situations of making sure they, they get it right. right. And, and I've never, never once second guessed a NASCAR photo finish, finish. Uh, uh, that Talladega race where they, they ruled that Elliott Sadler, Sadler was the winner, winner when he clearly, clearly should not have been. been. That, that's a different, different situation. situation. But, but in this situation, I'm 100% on board with what they said. Because, because the high-speed high camera, camera is there just for this. this. If, if you've, you've ever been on pit road pre-race, the, the area, area where the camera is set up at has you know, a, bit a bit of a barrier around it, and everything on it is like, do not, not touch. Like, they, they don't want you to get anywhere, anywhere near this. this. And, its and its sole purpose is to just record what happens at the start-finish line. Unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people understand that the line you see on track is not the finish line area, and they got a little bit upset about it. Fine, Fine whatever. whatever. I also, I also saw, saw a number of people mention that the splitter on the five car was, was longer than the splitter on the 17, 17 car. No, no again, again, they, they always use a standard spec splitter. splitter. It's, it's the same splitter, splitter on every car. car. The, the nose of the, of the car, car is different. So that so front, front bumper, bumper area on the five car because of the Chevrolet is different than it is on the 17 car because it's a Ford Mustang. So that just comes down to body design. The splitters are all the same. They're the same length. It's, it's just, just a, difference a difference in the, in the design, design of the front, the front bumper. bumper. Fantastic race, though. Top to bottom, best race we've seen with the Gen 7 car. Best race we've seen on a mile and a half in the better part of 20 years, we're being completely honest. This race was phenomenal. I gave it a 97 uh, in my you know immediate reaction post-race review. It had everything you could possibly want. It had four drivers leading 40 laps or more. You had multiple drivers making on-track green flag passes for the lead. In stage one, it was Denny Hamlin and Kyle Larson going back and forth and showing everybody what it was. Apologies for that. In stage one, it was Ross Chastain and Kyle Larson going back and forth and showing everybody how it was done. Later on, it was Chris Buescher and Denny Hamlin going back and forth and showing everybody how to race side by side. And they weren't driving away from one another. Somebody would get by, somebody else would get back by them, and then they keep kind of hanging it back and forth. You had great moves going into both turns one and two, specifically turn or turns one and three. Specifically turn three. Guys were absolutely throwing it on the bottom and then sliding up and trying to catch it and get that drive off. The Dale Jr. slide job, that type of thing. Yes, that was happening so many times, and it was so much fun to see. Kansas has aged into the perfect NASCAR track at this point. And if, if we can't have every race at Homestead, we should have every race at Kansas because it continues to be absolutely perfect. You have multiple lanes, you have slight off-throttle time, and you have tire wear. All things that create good racing. And that's what we need more of. We need more power so we have more tire wear and we have more off-throttle time. Not sure what we need to do to get that. Well, I think we all know what we need to do to get that, but I don't think we're ever going to get it, unfortunately. But this race was so good. You had an interesting strategy play out there at the end. I'm a person that doesn't love green white checker finishes. In all honesty, I would prefer prefer races to end at the scheduled race distance. This was supposed to be a 267 lap race. It ended up being 268 laps, so one extra lap. And honestly, if NASCAR didn't have a green white checker you know, rule in place, they honestly would have done a really quick yellow with that Kyle Busch spin. Caution came out on lap 262, and they went back to green at 266. They would have done a very quick yellow there, 
and it'd probably, probably restart, restart the race if there wasn't a rewrite checker, checker probably at 264 to create a two-lap shootout. So either way, we likely would have ended up with this finish. Um, but, but regardless, regardless really, really, really good race. Candace was, was not a race, race I think anybody expected Chris Buescher or the Fords to even be a factor in, for being completely honest. honest. Because, because up until this, this point, at Kansas, Kansas in the Gen 7 era, they, they had led a total of like 62 laps or 63 laps, laps something like, like that. A really, really low amount. amount. And, and then, then on Sunday night, Chris Buescher goes out there and leads 54 laps, laps by himself. Kyle, Kyle Larson, of course, has been in the mix and was in the, you know, catbird seat to win this race just last spring and then got turned by Danny Hamlin on the last lap. You can all have your own opinions on that because that was a controversial you know, you know moment, moment at the time last, last year, but, but it, it seemed, seemed like this was, was going to be another Toyota, Toyota race, race, right? Toyota 2311 specifically has dominated Kansas in the Gen 7 era. era. The, the 45 car has won three out of four races in the Gen one last, one. last spring, spring uh, you, know, you know, capped off, off the, Toyota the Toyota dominance here. here. And, and it looked like that might be the case again before that caution came out. It appeared, it appeared that, that probably Dick and Hamlin or Martin Martin Truck Jr. Jr. was going to win. win. Kyle, Kyle Larson had a really fast car. It was the second most uh, laps on Sunday. Sunday. But it wasn't, 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 wasn't a factor at the end until that caution came, came out. out. It was, it was an, an interesting, interesting race. race I, I, I like everything about it. The pre-race, I didn't watch a ton of the pre-race because the Formula 1 race was on. There was a very funny moment, though, that I clipped of Austin Dillon saying that if you come up to RCR at lunchtime, there's a lot of guys getting on, which is laugh out loud funny when you hear it out of context. He was, he was talking, talking about pickleball, pickleball but I like, I like to think, think that maybe our RCR, RCR might just be the most progressive team in the NASCAR, NASCAR at this point. point. But the, the everything that led up to it, Fox, the uh, Clint Boyer somehow coerced Denny Hamlin, peer pressured him into saying that this is Denny's year, that he's going to win the championship this year. He's calling his shot. And honestly, at this point, Denny has nothing to lose. This is his 19th year of trying to win a NASCAR Cup Series championship. Nothing else has worked. So maybe calling his shot will be the thing that finally puts him over the top and allows him to hold that trophy at the end of the year on stage at Phoenix. I don't think so. I highly doubt it. I mean, we have 18 prior years of what happens to this guy in crunch time, and at no point has it ever resulted in a championship trophy. So you can try something. There's that. Chase Elliott comes home third. Uh, great result for, for him as his top five streak continues, I believe. That is now four races, five races in a row for Chase Elliott. He has five top five finishes this year, six top tens. Oh, sorry, Talladega, he finished 15th. But taking Talladega out, five of the last six races have been top five finishes. So, yeah, I would say that they probably have found their footing and they've figured it out. So, good for that nine team and uh, Alan Gustafson. Denny Hamlin fifth, Chris Buescher, not Chris Buescher, Chris Rebell, P6, Alex Bowman, another top 10 finish. The neckbeards are not going to be happy about it. They're going to come out here and they're going to say, oh, what's going on here? Oh, Alex Bowman needs to be replaced. Didn't you guys see Ally was an associate sponsor on Roger Cruz's truck this weekend? That definitely means that Alex is going to get replaced. It doesn't. It absolutely does not mean that. Alex Bowman, once again, he has... His one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh top ten of the year. Again, we're 12 races into the season, a quarter of the way, no, a third of the way through at this point. What am I talking about? A third of the way through at this point. Yeah, the guy is on pace to have his best career, statistically speaking, as we go on. Kyle Busch, like I said, drove from, I believe, like 20 or 22nd to 8th in the final two laps. No Gregson gets another top 10 finish. He continues to lead the way for Stuart Haas Racing. Great result for him and Mike McDowell. Top 10 finish. And yeah, this comes in the same week that Steve Latar said that he would not finish better than 20th, I believe, was the line for McDowell this week. So McDowell had a little bit of fun with, with that. John Hunter can check P13. Todd Gillum, P14. Josh Barrett gets a top 15 finish, something that that 14 desperately needed. Corey Heim finishes 22nd. Corey Heim likely would have had a top 15 finish in his second Cup Series start. Uh, gets turned there at the end of the race. He and Austin Dillon got together, which Fox didn't show a replay of, which is highly unfortunate, but kind of tracked for how the whole day was going. Uh, but we did see an in-car from, I believe, Bob Wallace that showed the two of them wrecking, which we had a better angle of it. Jimmy Johnson. 
The, the curious, curious case, case of Jim Johnson, Johnson continues. continues. Some, Some fans are upset that he comes, comes back to run these races. races. Personally, I don't, I don't care because it's not going to tarnish his legacy. It's, it's not like when Darryl Waltrip ran an extra eight seasons after winning his final race at Darlington in 1992 and was, was basically a non-factor just in, in the way. way. Other, Other than, than those starts he made in the one car, at least he was eh, kind of competitive. But for Jimmy, he's coming back to run select races. In 2016, 2016, Jeff Gordon came, came back to run select races in that 88 car, and nobody even remembers those. 20 years from now, nobody's going to remember these Jimmy, Jimmy Johnson races, or being completely honest. He qualifies 19th, his best qualifying result uh, in the Gen 7 car, and then probably within the first 10 laps, he's 32nd. He said he was way too tight. He ends up getting punted by uh, Corey LeJoy, who's one of his best Kevin Magnuson impression by the, by the looks of it. And his, his day is done. done. Jimmy, Jimmy got out, did a hard, hard stare down of Corey LeJoy, and then you know, you know, went back, back to the hauler. hauler. He'll, He'll be, be back for the Coke 600, 600 at the end of May. May. Interested, Interested to see how he does there because he definitely seems like he's getting, getting a better, better grasp of the, of the car. car. Joe Logano, Logano spun out, um, tires went flat. Of course, that, that means that he has to lose two or three laps. Harrison Burton as well spun out. He ends up going six laps down, which was already... I believe, I believe one, one or two laps down at that time. time. But flat, flat tires, tires should not cost you multiple laps. It's, it's an inherent flaw with the car. And, and instead of trying to fix it, they're just like, oh, yeah, we'll just come up one back. back. No, there's, there's got to be a better solution to this. this. You, you shouldn't lose multiple laps because of a flat tire. Austin Dillon, 25th. Just absolutely does not have it this year. Austin Hill, 33rd. Again, Again, these, these RCR, RCR cars, when they're not Kyle Bush, Bush, are just not there for anybody at, at the moment. moment. Like, like I said, though, overall, overall really, really enjoyed, enjoyed this race. race. Did not have to talk about air blocking, didn't have to talk about, about, air air blocking, about, about mirror driving. driving. Of, course, of course, there was some of it that was going on, but nothing, nothing like what we saw at Dover last week. It was nice, kind of refreshing to see that all play out. And then on Sunday, we also had another race that, while the race maybe wasn't that great, it did have a really interesting finish. That would be the Formula One, you know, Miami Grand Prix, not the United States Grand Prix, the Miami Grand Prix, where for two hundred and eighty dollars you can get some main lobster rolls. And I hope that guy that continually commented on my TikTok video about this hops over here to the comments and is like, it actually, it actually feeds six to eight people. If you would just read it, you would actually know that. Calm down, bud. You commented it like twelve times. Actually, more than that. I think I went through yesterday and I got up to twenty. Five or 26 different comments from the same guy basically playing defense for the Miami Grand Prix and the Hard Rock Beach Club, which is very bizarre. But if you saw pictures of the food that was being offered there, at no point could that feed six to eight people unless it's like your aunts or a toddler who's going to take one bite of something. Oh, here's a plate of wings for six to eight people. You all get two. All right. But yeah, okay, whatever. Moving on to the actual race, though. Pre-race, you had Martin Brundle once again on his grid walk. Mistake. <laughs> once again, mistake a mixed individual for Patrick Mahomes. Martin, not every light-skinned guy is Patrick Mahomes. We just have to get over that at this point. It's bad. It's like calling every Australian Nigel or something. Or at least that's what Jordan Clarkson told me. You can't do it. You just can't do it. Uh, so that was awkward. The rest of the pre-race stuff was... You know, it was what it was. Uh, of course, there was a former president there, and he was, of course, attracted to the Orange team, which all of that checks out. Uh, so, you know, he that was a topic. You can look at the pictures on social if you want to. We don't do politics here. Moving on to the actual race, though, it started off. It started off almost with an absolute bang. Sergio Perez goes all cruise missile. Looked like he was locked on to his teammate Max Verstappen into turn one. Just narrowly missed him. Somehow didn't, didn't make contact with Max, which would have really sent this race into absolute chaos. Max survives. Sergio, of course, does Sergio things and ends up getting passed by the Ferraris. And then we go into the actual you know race as it's playing out. And as it's going, we're watching it, and you're like, ah. It's, it's not doing, doing it's, it's Miami, Miami, right? You don't, don't expect much out of it. There's, There's some decent mid pack racing. Uh, that little hokey Hard Rock Beach Club you know, stadium section down there with the Mickey Mouse Formula E chicane. Set up for some pretty decent passing opportunities down that, what we would consider the mid stretch, I guess. Uh, 
into the hard, the hard left hand that goes into the hard rock beach club area. That set up some good passing, some good battles through there. You have multiple people trying to make passes through that little chicane, which was just never going to work. But at the end of the day, it at least produced some decent battles through there. At one point, Sky had everybody on the edge of their seats for a battle for 16th place between Daniel Ricciardo and Oscar Piastri. Uh, which, which is something Fox NASCAR, uh, the Daytona, Daytona 500, 500 call from, from I think a year ago, when Stenhouse won was just Mike Joy going, going Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Jr. When's the Daytona, Daytona 500? What? what? Sky had everybody clamoring for more of the 16th place battle on track. And, and for, for the record, record, the 16th place battle on track, at the, the, uh, those two drivers ended up moving forward. But, but yeah, yeah there's, there's, there was only... 19 cars, cars left on track, track at that point. point. So, so they're, they're racing for third to last, last essentially, fourth to last, and still manage to make it exciting. exciting. The, the race really spiced up, though, when Lando Norris and... Ma- the race really spiced up, though, when Lando Norris and McLaren were running long on strategy, just hoping for a safety car. And that gamble, yeah, it finally paid off because they were able to get out in front, get the safety car after Kevin Magnuson apparently wanted to try out for the Miami Dolphins and absolutely punted Logan Sargent off into the barriers. Logan Sargent, once again, does not finish his home Grand Prix. Rumors continue to swirl that he will be replaced potentially by the time we get to Imola um, in two weeks' time. Who knows if that's going to happen. Not ideal for him. That brings out a safety car. The safety car does not pick up Lando Norris. Lando Norris has already passed pit exit. So that allows Lando to go around at a reasonable speed, pit, and then exit while maintaining the lead. So the race restarts with Lando Norris in the lead, Max Verstappen in second. Max, before all this happened, had run over the bollard in the Mickey Mouse chicane, and that brought out a virtual safety car. But according to Christian Horner and the Red Bull guys, who, of course, couldn't just accept defeat, have to come out and make some sort of excuses, come out and they're like, yeah, it damaged the floor of the car. That's why he lost so much pace. Well, I mean, Lando goes on to win the race by 7.6 seconds. So, uh, yes, if you want to make an excuse, make your excuse. But the McLaren absolutely had the pace to win this race in the second half. When they got out front, he was just gone. And he was untouchable. And for Lando Norris, he picks up his first Formula 1 career victory. Of course, it looked like he was on track to win his first race back at Sochi in 2021. And then the team stupidly let him decide strategy and went to pit for for tires. And then the rain came and he got absolutely swallowed up by Lewis Hamilton and ends up not winning that race. He then had to sit around and watch his teammate win a race in Daniel Ricciardo at Monza for the Italian Grand Prix. He had to watch his other teammate, Oscar Piastri, win the sprint in uh, Qatar last year. And now he finally gets to stand on top of the podium in his 110th Formula One start. 109 Grands Prix vi- are, have gone by. He finally gets to stand on the top step of the podium, which was great for, for Lando, right? The guy is super talented. Is he the generational talent some people think he is? That nah, remains to be seen. He certainly has the pace. He certainly has the 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 drive and the skill to get this done. And we saw that happen on Sunday. You give him an opportunity to win and he capitalized on it. I think he learned a lot from it and he no longer has to be included in that Nick Heidfeld conversation about most podiums without ever having a Formula One victory. So for Lando, massive accomplishment for him, for the team, massive accomplishment for them as well. Yeah, this isn't the Ron Dennis McLaren. They're not fully back. Are they going to contend for the championship this year? No. But are they going to contend for another race win, maybe two, throughout the year? Yeah, I think they could. I honestly think they could. They showed great pace, and they said that this track wasn't exactly suited for their car. So we'll have to wait and see what comes of McLaren throughout the rest of the year. Lando Norris finishes, obviously, first. Max Verstappen, second. And Charles Leclerc finishes P3 on the day. Sergio Perez comes on fourth. Carlos Sainz in fifth, Luke, or Lewis Hamilton uh, sixth, Yuki Tsunoda seventh, George Russell eighth, Fernando Alonso ninth, and Esteban Ocon finishes in tenth. Ocon and Alonso had a great battle going on as well. Kevin Magnussen was given more penalties and more penalty points. He's now on the verge of a one-race ban for bad driving. He's gone out there and done everything that Haas has asked him to do in terms of blocking so that Nico Hulkenberg can get a decent result, but he cannot be happy about 
about that whatsoever. So the Miami Grand Prix is come and gone once again. I, you know, obviously this is the most memorable one that they've had so far. I saw somebody on social say that the Miami Grand Prix is a beautiful race, a beautiful track. What? It's in the parking lot of an NFL stadium, and they just go ahead and paint half the parking lot aqua blue, and people are like, oh yeah, this is great. This is the most mid-tier NFL stadium. It doesn't even rank in like anybody's, probably even top 15, maybe even top 20 best NFL stadiums in the country. It's just in Miami, so it gets big events because it's in my well, it's in Miami Gardens. It's still a solid half hour to 45 minutes away from actual South Beach, Miami. But don't let that stand in the way of having a good time. It's like when people from Joliet say they live in, live in Chicago, and they're like, well, Chicago adjacent, sure. In relative terms, yes, you are closer to Chicago than like Annapolis, Maryland, but in the the scheme of things, you don't live in Chicago. Miami Gardens is closer to Miami than Daytona is to Miami, but it's still not Miami. So, yeah, it, it's here to stay. They have a 10-year contract, so they'll continue to make things. Obvious, honestly, I just don't really love the track layout. It's just, it's not a street circuit, but it's not a purpose-built circuit. There's no elevation change. There's a Mickey Mouse chicane. There's just some things I think that could probably be done better here. But again, you're in the parking lot of an NFL stadium. And then, of course, the obsession around the celebrities and influencers that go to the race and not the actual on-track product, which is what I'm the, tuning in to watch. I'll never go to the Miami Grand Prix. Like, that's just not my scene. But, yeah, if, you know, people want to go and be seen there, fine. That's great. I hope everybody has a great time. It just feels like the racing portion of the Formula One Grand Prix weekend is a back burner by a lot to what's happening everywhere else that's not on track. We also had a truck race on Friday night. Real, real quick recap here. Corey Heim wins. It was a pretty straightforward truck race, we're being completely honest. Um, very uneventful. Solid race, but just uneventful. Flew by. Just absolutely flew by when I was watching it. So, yeah, Corey Heim wins the race. I don't really have that much else to add about it because not a ton happened there. But Heim is, again, the championship favorite as we head into the rest of the season. So, coming up, we have the NASCAR all three. Truck, Xfinity, and Cup Series at Darlington this weekend. Trucks on Friday night, Cup, uh, Xfinity on Saturday, and Cup on Sunday for the throwback weekend. I'll have a video out this week about the NASCAR throwback paint schemes, probably on Tuesday. Formula One is off this weekend, and IndyCar will have their Indianapolis Grand Prix on Saturday afternoon. I believe it's a 3.30-ish start time at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I'll be in attendance. So if you will be at the Grand Prix this weekend, yeah, maybe you'll see me. I don't know if I'll wear anything brake hard, but I'm very tall and stick out in a crowd. So I hope to see you all there. Break hard merch. If you want the support yoga short track or other things, they are available at breakhard.store. The link is in the description below. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at breakhard, Instagram and Twitter at breakhardblog.